Mockingbird by Katherine Erskine, a first Chapter Friday read aloud video with The Word Nerd. Today, as you listen, watch for the story quote that will appear on screen. Write it down, word by word, and follow the instructions given to you by your teacher. Stick around to the end of the video to see if you were right. Hi, my name is Amanda Ziva. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, and another First Chapter Friday video. This week, I'm going to be reading to you from Mockingbird by Katherine Erskine. You can see from the cover here, it's award-winning. It's amazing. I know you're going to love it. I'm going to read you the blurb so you know what it's about, and then I'm going to tell you two quick things before I read you the very first, very quick first two chapters. Good and strong and beautiful. Ten-year-old Caitlin's world had always been black and white. Anything else was confusing, but her brother Devin helped her understand. Then tragedy struck, and now nothing makes sense. As a girl with Asperger's syndrome, Caitlin turns to what she does know, textbooks and dictionaries. And after reading the definition of closure, she realizes that this is what everyone needs. In her search for closure, she discovers that black and white are surrounded by shades of gray, and that those are beautiful and necessary for healing. Okay, those two things I wanted to talk to you about real quick. Right away, we learn that our main character, Caitlin, has Asperger's Syndrome. If you're curious about this and you want to read more stories that feature characters on the Asperger's Syndrome or who have autism, uh, there are many, many out there. I'm going to put a link in the description box to an article that lists, I think, like 25 amazing ones. Um, also on this channel, I have this book, Rules, that you can listen to the first chapter of uh, the main character's brother, David. Um, has autism in this book, and it's a great look at um, at him and his life and um, what it looks like to live with autism or Asperger's syndrome. So that's the first little interesting thing I wanted to tell you about before reading this book. The second thing is that it it hints in here to a tragic event that happens, um, and that this I, I want you to know that this tragedy that happens in the story might be very triggering for some people, and so I'm gonna put what that event is in the description box. I don't want to say it out loud because I don't want it to be a spoiler, but I also don't want you to walk into this not knowing it. Um, teachers, if this could be something um, that hits close home, close to home for your for your students, and um, I just want you to know about it ahead of time so that you are not caught unaware and walking into something that you're not ready to discuss. So uh, that being said, I am going to dive into the first two chapters of Mockingbird by Katherine Erskine. Chapter one, Devin's chest. It looks like a one-winged bird crouching in the corner of our living room, hurt, trying to fly every time the heat pump turns on with a click and a groan and blows cold air onto the sheets and lifts it up and flutters for just a moment and then falls down again, still, dead. Dad covered it with the gray sheet so I can't see it, but I know it's there and I can still draw it. I can take my charcoal pencil and copy what I see, a grayish square thing that's almost as tall as me with only one wing. Underneath the sheet is Devin's Eagle Scout project. The chest Dad and Devin were making so he'll be ready to teach other Boy Scouts about how to build a chest. I feel all around the sheet just to be sure his chest is underneath. It's cold and hard and stiff on the outside and cavernous on the inside. My dictionary says cavernous means filled with cavities or hollow areas. That's what's on the inside of Devin's chest. Hollow areas. And the outside is the part that looks like a bird's broken wing because the sheet hangs off it loosely. Under the sheet is a piece of wood that's going to be the door once Dad and Devin finish the chest. Except now I don't know how they can, now that Devin is gone. The bird will be trying to fly but never getting anywhere, just floating and falling, floating and falling. The gray of outside is inside, inside the living room, inside the chest, inside me. It's so gray that turning on a lamp is too sharp and it hurts, so the lamps are off. But it's still too bright. It should be black inside, and that's what I want, so I put my head under the sofa cushion where the green plaid fabric smells like Dad's sweat and Devin's socks and my popcorn, and the cushion feels soft and heavy on my head, and I push deeper so my shoulders and chest can get under it too, and there's a weight on me that holds me down and keeps me from floating and falling and floating and falling like the bird. Chapter 2. Look at the person. Caitlin, Dad says, the whole town is upset at what happened. They want to help. How? 
They want to be with you, talk to you, take you places. I don't want to be with them or talk to them or go places with them. He sighs. They want to help you deal with life, Caitlin, without Devin. I don't know what this means, but the people come to our house. I wish I could hide in Devin's room, but I'm not allowed in there now, not since the day our life fell apart and Dad slammed Devin's door shut and put his head against it and cried and cried, no, 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 no. So I can't go to my hidey hole in Devin's room anymore and I miss it. I try to hide in my room and draw, but Dad comes and gets me. There's so many voices in our house. Voices from Devin's Boy Scout troop, I recognize their green pants, and the nice things that they say about Devin. Voices of relatives, Dad introduces me to them. He says, you remember, and then he says a name. And I say no, because I don't remember. Dad says, look at the person. So I look quickly at a nose or a mouth and an ear, but I still don't remember. One voice says, I'm your second cousin. Another says, wasn't it a beautiful memorial service? Another says, I love your drawings. You're a very talented artist. Will you draw something for me? One even says, aren't you lucky to have so many relatives? I don't feel lucky, but they keep coming. Relatives we hardly saw when Devin was here, so how can they help? Neighbors like the man who yelled at Devin to get off his lawn, how can he help? People from school, Mrs. Brooke, my counselor, Miss Harper, the principal, all my teachers since kindergarten except my real fifth grade teacher because she left after what happened at Devon School. I don't get it because nothing bad happened at James Madison Elementary School, so why did she have to leave? Now Mrs. Johnson is my teacher. She didn't even know Devon except she watched him play basketball, she says, twice. I've watched the LA Lakers play more than twice and I don't try to help them. Caitlin. If you ever want to talk about what happened, you just let me know, Mrs. Johnson says. That's what Mrs. Brooke is for, I tell her. Maybe we could all sit down together. Why? So we know where you're coming from. I look around the living room and stare at the sheet-covered chest. I come from here. I'm sorry. I meant so we all know how you're feeling. Oh, Mrs. Brooke knows how I'm feeling, so you can find out from her. I would be superfluous. My dictionary says superfluous means exceeding what is sufficient or necessary. I just thought it would be nice to take some time to sit down and chat. I shake my head. Superfluous also means marked by wastefulness. Well, okay then, she says. I suppose I can talk with Mrs. Brooke. Mrs. Brooke says you can talk with her anytime because her door is always open, I tell Mrs. Johnson. Actually, it's almost always closed, but if you knock, then she remembers to open it. Thank you, Caitlin. She doesn't move. This means she is waiting for me to say something. I hate that. It makes my underarms prickle and get wet. I almost start sucking my sleeve like I do at recess, but then I remember. You're welcome, I say. She moves away. <clears throat> I got it right. I go to the refrigerator and put a smiley face sticker on my chart under your manners. Seven more and I get to watch a video. When I turn away from the fridge, I see a puffy blue marshmallow wall in front of me. It smells of apple cinnamon Pop-Tarts and breathes noisily. It's another neighbor <clears throat> or relative. I don't know which. Her hands are shaking. One hand has a tissue and the other hand she holds out to me. There is a white circle on it. Would you like this candy? I don't know. I've never had her candy before, so I don't know if I'll like it. But I like just about every candy in the galaxy. I don't like being trapped by the puffy blue wall like this, though. Take it, she says, and pushes it into my hand. So I take it just to get her hand off mine because her hand is squishy and flabby and it makes me feel sick. Have another, she says. I take it quickly so I won't have to feel her hand again. She tries to pat my head with a candy hand, but I duck. I run and hide behind Dad and eat the candy. They are mints. I wish they were gummy worms because that's my favorite, but I deal with it. The good thing is I can't talk when my mouth is full because that's rude, so if I can keep my mouth full, I can be in my own Caitlin world. When I finish the candy, I still don't want to talk, so I put my head under Dad's sweater and feel the warmth of his chest as he breathes up and down, and I smell his Gillette Cool Wave antiperspirant and deodorant. He doesn't even say, no, Caitlin, and pull me out. He lets me stay there and pats my head through the sweater. If it's through the sweater, I don't mind. Otherwise, I don't like anyone to touch me. Dad talks to the world outside the sweater and his voice makes a low, hummy, vibrate feel. I close my eyes and I wish I could stay here forever. 
if you want to know uh, what happens next for Caitlin and how she manages this new grief-stricken world, um, and the other other things that happen to her, you're wanna, gonna want to pick up a copy of this book, Mockingbird, uh, by the wonderful Catherine Erskine. I'll put all the links that you need down there in the description box, and I hope that you join me again for another First Chapter Friday video. I'll see you again next time. Happy reading! To continue reading Mockingbird by Katherine Erskine, check out a copy from your school library, purchase one from a local indie bookstore, or grab it via the link in the description box. Then be sure to check out the rest of the First Chapter Friday playlist. It has over 80 amazing books waiting for you. This week's mystery quote says, Sometimes I read the same books over and over and over. What's great about books is that the stuff inside doesn't change. Thanks for listening. Please like this video and subscribe, and be sure to come back again for more great content from The Word Nerd. Happy reading!